Before I uh, give you the dictation, I also want to mention a few other things. One is the word slang. Is it countable or non-countable? Carol? Good. Whenever I ask a question, that's a good guess. If I ever ask if it's countable or non-countable, it's good to guess it's non-countable. Because usually I ask it because you put an S after it. Slang, 不能加 us. How about vocabulary? No. How about information? How about punctuation? Non countable, because a lot of you say punctuations and slangs. Both of those, okay? Punctuation. You can say punctuation marks, right? But not punctuations. Mm. And then please do help us get some of these uh, final exams back to students from last semester who are not, there, are not here this semester. Is everybody ready with a piece of paper you can hand in? Don't put it in a precious notebook that you don't want to tear a page out, Carol. <laughs> of. Everybody, make sure it's a page that you can hand in. All right, everybody's ready. Start on the... Right side of the paper, don't don't zai zuo bian. Everybody knows that. Don't don't zai zuo bian. And yeah. <laughs> Why are the don't don't zai zuo bian? You had it right. You had it right. Don't change. <laughs> okay? This is the way we read a book, a notebook. We open it like this and the first page is here. The first page is not here. So, this is you may think it's small, but actually it's very big because if a Westerner picks up a sheet of paper that starts on, on this page, it will feel really odd. And if you're applying for a job, your boss may decide not to hire you because of that. It's just like common sense. If you're missing that common sense, they'll think, what, what other common sense are you missing? So all of your classes, don't don't, for the first page. Everybody's got that. Uh huh. And going back to our, our dictation, there will be no implosives, okay? No implosives, so don't let that confuse you by guessing whether it's implosive or not. There are no implosives. And I'm going to use the microphone to make sure everything is clear. There are 10 items, but this time there is no spelling. There's only IPA. When we had English, we had spelling and IPA, but this time there's only IPA. Therefore, each one will be 10 points. And here we go. You may not do well on the first dictation. This is probably the first non-English dict dictation that we've had in the whole course. And here we go. Everybody ready? You need to be quiet when I'm reading. I'll say each one twice and go over the whole list at the end. Okay, watch me. Watch me while I'm dictating. One. Ah. Ah. Ready? Look up when you're ready. Two. Ga. Ga. Ready? Everyone ready? Three. Ba. Ba. And just to save us a lot of trouble, which vowel are we using? I, we know it's ah, how are we gonna write it? It's this one. So it's not a test on vowels. All of the vowels are ah. If you put a maozi on it, take the maozi off. Tom out. Okay, this is the vowel we're using, ah. No, no maozi. Uh, number four, ready? Ta. IPA in brackets, not in slashes, in brackets. Ready? Number five. Ka. Ka. Look 
up when you're ready. Six. Da. Da. Ready? Seven. Ka. Ka. Number eight. Da. Da. Number nine. Ta. Ta. Number ten, ba, ba. We have a how many way distinction of initial stops in this dictation. A how many way, is it a one way distinction, two way, three way, four way, five way distinction? That means how many kinds of stop, stops do we have in the initial position? How many different kinds? Six, we have a four-way opposition. We have a four-way opposition among the stops, four ways. That means there are four different kinds of stops. That's to help you further, to make sure that you don't make any mm, careless or easy to make mistakes. I'm going to read the whole thing over slowly. Everybody watch me and listen, and then check your work for each one. So I'll say it, look down, make sure it's okay, and I'll go on to the next one. One, ah. Two, ga. Three, ba. Four, ta. Five, ka. Six, da. Seven, ka. Eight, da. Nine, ah. Ten, ba. Okay? Check your work. Make sure your name and other information is in the upper right hand corner of your paper. And we're going to put the answers on the board to check our work. So check over your work again. Make sure your information is in the upper right hand corner. And then let's mark it. Mm. Okay, Sylvie. So One, Carol. Two, Vivian. Three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Gang gang ha. Put the answers on the board. Let's check our work. Exchange papers, please. One. Everybody say it. Ah. 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 Okay, that is an ejective. Very good. Two. Ga. Ga. Right, I made the voicing pretty strong. This is a fully voiced initial stop. Three. Ba. Three is ba. How do we write it? P-A. So number three, you will know for next time. Ba. It's just like in Chinese. Ba ba. Ba ba, just as like an E. And we write it with P because, sorry, Jerome? An unaspirated, unvoiced, or voiceless initial stop by labial. Okay? So we haven't learned the, a, sound, a sound like this at all. And actually, they're very, very rare. So it'd be, uh -huh. I, I can't even do a good voiced ejective because they're so unusual. I didn't bother trying to learn one. Ejectives are almost always voiceless. They're usually, I, I hear there are exceptions, but I don't know of any language. They're, if you look in the literature, you'll probably say, ah, we found an exception, but it's rare. So we're not going to bother with it. This should be just ba. It's not ejective, it's not voiced. So, take a good day. And then, but you'll know for next time. And for number four, go ahead. Ta. Ta. And that's also, ni wo ta da ta in Chinese. Ta. And five. Ah, beautiful. That is an adjective and six. Da. And that's also 
the same as Chinese, da, da xiao de da. It's not da xiao. I was walking with Sophie after class one day and said, she said, Miss Chong, you just voiced a stop. I said, oh, what did I do? Well, one was an IG. But I was, it was in a sentence. Oh, something like iban instead of ban. And Sophie heard it right away. She said, Miss Chong, you just voiced that stop. It doesn't sound Chinese. I go, you're right. But actually, it happens occasionally in Chinese when stops are between vowels. They sometimes get voiced just due to assimilation. You're getting ready for the vowel. It won't sound very Chinese, but it happens on occasion. I've read papers about that. So you don't have initial voice stops in Chinese. That was a Chinese da xiao de da. So this should be written TA. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Wrong one. Wang Da. Okay, this one is just TA. We'll close that A there, okay? Da xiao de da. So you're going to have to be really careful. And I can't blame you for a habit like this because if I said da to an American, that's what they would write. Or to a Brit as well. Any native English speaker because. Um, if they're voiceless, then we'll aspirate them ta, right? But if it's supposed to be a voice stop, the point is we don't usually voice it at the beginning of an utterance, right? For example, day after day, 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 day after day. I didn't voice it and it sounds perfectly normal. So as a native English speaker, if you're a native English speaker, that's probably what you would write, but now we're phoneticians. And we had, that's why specifically pointed out we have a four-way contrast. A four-way contrast. That means we're going to have to distinguish between ba and pa with a raised small h. All right, so this one should be da. And then number seven is ka, and that's correct. And eight is And you can hear the difference now. Da, 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 da. You can all hear it well now, right? You can all hear it really clearly. And ten, a nine is ta, ta. Another adjective. And number ten is ba. ba. Right. And it's not ba. It's not an implosive. I said there'd be no implosives. But this contrasts with, we don't have a ba here. Oh, there it is. The one we were just talking about. So say this one and then say this one. Go. Ba. And? Ba. ba. Okay. How do you say zo in Minayu? Ba. Okay. There you go. All right. Ten points off for each incorrect answer. Subtract from 100 and hand in the papers, please. So if you didn't do that well on the first one, don't worry too much because you'll get used to it. Last semester you had to get used to the dictations and that took a while. So this will happen again this semester because now we're working with exotic new sounds. And you'll need to get used to some different things to listen for, like voiceless, unaspirated initial stops. Okay, hand in your papers, please, if they're ready. Okay, very, very quickly, Xu uh, Hua. One reason you should do things early, and I'm just as bad as anybody else putting things off to the last minute. I do that with things when they are difficult. If they're hard, then I will put them off. That's the way we humans work. All of us are like that. If it's something I think I'm in pretty good control of, I get it done early because it's easy. Or maybe it's not easy, easy, but it's something I'm interested in and I feel I'm in control. So for example, I just got a tonzi yesterday and uh, my editor Lizzie says, uh, it's going to be due on April 5th. So here it is. One month early, one month early. Yeah, other work is not getting done, but that got done. <laughs> because I feel in control, I have a plan for that, I know what I want to write. It's stuff that I've been telling you in class over and over again, mostly, with a few new things. So the new article is now finished. Uh, it still needs editing. The point is, um, we have different schedules for ourselves for different kinds of tasks. But it's really good when you have something that's a bit difficult, that you have to push yourself on, to start early in spite of yourself. Now, in this Zen newsletter I get, they say that very often when we don't do things we know we should, there's a voice inside of us saying, 
just have that piece of cake. It doesn't matter. One piece of cake doesn't matter. Look, everybody else is having that piece of cake. You can have that piece of cake too. <laughs> right. It's just a voice. And they say you don't have to listen to the voice. You can, you can let, let it play in your head. It's like a recording. You can just listen till it's done and then ignore it. So go ahead and let the voice play. And when it's done, okay, now I'm going to not eat the cake, for example. The same is for doing things like reading vowels and consonants. But I don't think that's going to be a big burden because it's not that difficult. It, a lot of it is review. And I think in general, it's interesting material. But the original point I wanted to make is start early on things whenever you can, even if they're a little bit difficult and you've got a little internal resistance, because it gives your brain time to chew on it, to work on it. If, for example, you do something like at 2 a.m. and you have to hand it in at 8, your brain does not have time to process it and to think about possible questions or to make connections to other things you know. That could lead to interesting discussions in class. So the earlier you start, your brain will start working on things it wasn't thinking about before. It'll grab some old information you've got in your head and come up with a really interesting discussion topic or question. But that doesn't happen if you do it at 2 a.m. the day before it's due. Um, so this is not, I'm not scolding anybody. I'm just saying there's a huge advantage to starting earlier because then your brain does all kinds of interesting things that it doesn't have a chance to do if you start too late. Okay? That's an important point in life in general. So even if you're feeling a strong resistance, listen to the resistance, wait till they're done talking, and then just start. And another trick is something you don't want to do, you think, well, I won't do it. I'll just open up the book. And I'll open up my notebook and I'll put a pen there. And then I'll open up a new file in Word. Okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to you know, open up everything. And once you open up everything and the pen's in your hand, you often start writing. You often start working when everything is ready right in front of you because you've made it easy for yourself. If all of the books are stuffed in your book bag and then your pen is out of ink and you don't know where your, your children die is and all that stuff. If the stuff isn't together, it's going to take a lot of effort just to set up your desk. But if everything is just sitting there on your desk, it's sort of like going to invite you over. Look, look, you can just sit down and do your work now. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a trick and it works pretty well because once you start and say, okay, I'm not going to do the work, but I will just read one paragraph, one paragraph, and then you've started and then you're okay. All right? Those are tricks. They work. Really, they do. They do, because we all have to battle with procrastination and not wanting to do stuff that we need to do. All right, if there are no particular problems with vowels and consonants, I'm going to ask you on Wednesday. I hope your questions are ready then. Uh, we're going to go to our textbook again. Yeah, questions on vowels and consonants. Um, page 12. Yeah. Um, you, said that, you said that there are two reasons why we don't use uh, as many symbols to uh, indicate chunks. The first one is because they think five levels is enough. Right. But I don't understand um, the other reason because it's the um, the second is that I wanted to keep to the conventional way of describing Chinese tone. Right. So so um Oh, sorry, uh, is that still in the first reason? He said, but if we use just five levels, it actually will be have difficulty fitting continuous variations in pitch into the limited set of categories. What does that mean? Can you say that a little more slowly? I didn't catch everything. That sounds just the last sentence. Um, um, if we use just five levels, inevitably, we will have difficulty fitting the continuous variations in pitch into this limited set of categories. Oh, okay. Um, one example is the Beijing third tone. We talked about five levels of pitch for representing Chinese tones last semester. You weren't here last semester. And first of all, I'm going to repeat something for your benefit and then for the rest of you to review. That normally for tones of Chinese, we use those five levels. But for, and also for dialects of Chinese in general, all dialects, not just Mandarin. We usually use a five-level system. But for Minayu, some of you remember, we only need how many levels? Four. We only need four because the highest pitch tone, the first tone, is not five-five. It's four-four. Mm -hmm. And we often have a similar system in Mandarin due to influence from Minayu. 
So the first tone in Mandarin is also a 4-4 in Taiwan, not in Beijing, but in, Mand in Mandarin and Taiwan. So we could probably get by on a four-level system for Taiwan Mandarin. However, the fourth tone starts pretty high, qu. So, for example, he, he, shui de, he, he. it's not he, he, shui. That doesn't sound Taiwanese. That doesn't sound like Taiwan Mandarin, right? Sounds very mainland, mainland, very Beijing. He shui. We say he shui. Right. So we use a 4-4. Four, four. But for chu, it's not chu. It's chu. It starts pretty high. The fourth tone. In my observation, you can argue with me, and if you have data and proof, that's fine. You can share it. But I think the fourth tone, it's worth keeping the fifth tone in order, or the fifth level, to represent the fourth tone as 5-1. Chu. It goes from the highest to the lowest point. Chu. You can sometimes say it lower. And as we mentioned, the third tone in Taiwan Mandarin, is it a falling, rising tone? No, for example, so. It only goes down. In Taiwan Mandarin, I hear people sometimes talking in a low voice. Like at the end of the sentence, your voice gets really low. One thing I've noticed is, first of all, a second tone turns into a third tone at the end of a sentence. Have you noticed that? For example, pin chong. We don't say pin chong at the end of a sentence. Now, you may think it sounds funny, but start listening, putting in your notes. Put it in your notes. I guarantee you that you hear it all the time. Because when I first heard it, I thought, that's a second tone. Why did he say pin chong? At the end of a sentence, a second tone is usually realized. We use the verb realized. Realized is 呈现. A, a second tone at the end of a sentence is usually realized as a third tone. And that's partly due to downstepping declination, slowing down and having a lower pitch at the end of a sentence. Start listening. So put it in your notes. I want you to observe. And if you can prove I'm wrong, great. Give me your data. But I've been listening to this for like 10 years. So <laughs> Out of the blue, maybe you're surprised. Just like you were shocked when I told you that the third tone doesn't rise. Weren't you shocked the first time? No? Because you're my former student. All right? How did you know it then? You observed it or? You noticed. That's wonderful. Because most native speakers, they know it perfectly well because they say, ah, guide Ah, weiaozo. They won't say weiaozo. Nobody says it that way. You know that, you know that implicitly because it shows in your speech, but if you had to write on a paper what does the third tone look like, you would almost all say it rises at the end, right? At least in the past, because that's what you learn in school. But it's zo. Zo. Not zo. All right? So, that may have been a shock, and Yangda, the second tone at the end of an utterance being a, actually being a third tone is probably also a shock. And what I originally started out saying is, although I think that a five is necessary for the fourth tone, chu starts pretty high. When people speak in a lower voice, when they're slowing down, getting to the end of an utterance, sometimes a fourth tone, a fourth tone sounds like a third tone. Chu. I can't tell if it's chu or chu at the end of a sentence often. I, it's happened with many people. When my son was saying it, I had him repeat it many times, and he was actually making a fourth tone that started very low. So that's another thing to watch. Those are three, well, three things to watch. The third tone we knew about a long time ago. Second tone at the end of an, end of an utterance, does it sound like a third tone? A fourth tone, if they're already speaking slowly and in a low pitch, a, a fourth tone, may sound like a third tone. It goes down so low. So it starts to sound like a third tone. I've noticed this a lot. So everybody start noticing these things. And your data is around you constantly, right? Everybody's speaking in Mandarin all day long. So you'll have a lot of chance to observe it. All right, back to Sylvie's question. Um, so we've established a system of five levels to represent Chinese tones. And he's saying that 
He doesn't want to change that. For some dialects, maybe we don't need all those five tones, like for Taiwan Mandarin, or certainly for Minai, four is enough. But we just want to stick to the system so it's consistent across dialects, number one. And number two, sometimes it's not adequate to show all of the changes in a tone. So this is one down here. This is five up here. Here's three in the middle. Here's two, and here's four. So let's say that, just to explain what you're asking about, let's say that the third tone looks like this. Let's make it a little lower. Let's say that the third tone starts somewhere below two. It's not quite on two. Okay, this time we've got a little creak in it. Let me draw it again. So it starts somewhere below two, comes up just a little bit above three. Let's What are we going to call this tone in numbers? How are we going to describe it in numbers? This is a third tone, a Beijing type third tone. Let's just jia ding. It starts somewhere below two but above one, and it ends somewhere above three. How are we going to write it down in numbers? Two, one, three or four, right? Just based on this data. Just based on this data. So either two, one, three or two, one, four. But is that really accurate? We're just talking about this hypothetical case. I'm not saying that the third tone is really this way. I'm saying if it were. If this is the data we collected. So is either one of these really clear or accurate? No, because this is going to be too high. This is going to be too high. This is going to be too low. Right? Does that answer the question? So we have five levels for all the languages and we try for to all Chinese dialects. And we try to fit all the dialects into this system. Right. That's right. And often it's not a very good fit. But it's close enough. So it's easier to digitalize this way. It's easier to transcribe our data if we just have an agreed upon system. There will be variation. And maybe it's not accurate, we can put that in a note in our transcriptions. Okay? That answers the question? Good. Anybody else? Um, you just talked about the uh, effects of intonations on our tongue. So, how exactly do we, uh, I mean, Mandarin speakers, come on these two? Because I think tone is um, this difference in pitch and intonation as well. So does that affect our tone or in some case? Okay, excellent question. And this has been, I mentioned last semester, I know I saw it in one of the videos I reviewed. This has been a pretty hot topic in Chinese linguistics for many years, is to what extent is Chinese an intonational language? Because every language has to have intonation. We all inherently understand intonation. Like I said, even dogs understand intonation very well, very well. So Chinese obviously has intonation, but the realization is often different. Realization, In English, it's mainly what? A couple things. Okay, stress. Stress is actually just a label. What, is, uh, what does stress represent, or how do we realize stress? Number one? Pitch. Number two? Loudness is not number two. Let's put that at number four. Length, clarity of the vowel, and then loudness is number four. Right. With intonation, we rely mostly on pitch and length. Right. Of course, we use stress and all those other things. But pitch and length are what we play around with most in intonation. You said, what? You said, what? Went way up there. But you cannot do that so sui bin in Chinese because you need your tones for lexical purposes, right? There's lexical tone, you cannot mess that up. And foreigners learning your language will often do that, and it's very funny. Like, I had a, a classmate years ago, and once we have said an intonation, we will usually keep it if there's a parallel phrase after it. And he was talking about teaching children English, and he would say to them, hao bu hao wan, kuai bu kuai le. Why did he do that? He already established his pattern with hao bu hao wan. The next one is perfectly parallel, right? Wan chuan de ping xin de jie In English, we would use the same intonation probably. 
So, how about how one? Quite a quite All right? So, you can't do that in Chinese. You can't and still sound like a Chinese speaker. So, you cannot play around with pitch too much. What do you do? Just imagine a sentence where part of the sentence is important, you're going to emphasize it. How do you do it? Number one, there's a way you do it that is not phonetic, really. It's grammatical. And that is, if you're really going to emphasize it, you're going to put it at the end of the sentence. That's number one. So in fact, you should put that in your notes. Chinese intonation often uses a grammatical means. Or let's say that emphasis in Chinese often uses a grammatical means. Put it at the end. That's the first thing you do. And that often corresponds to what we do with intonation in English. So number one is take care of the grammar part. Number two, what do you do? Assuming you're going to use phonetic means now to emphasize something, what do you do first in Chinese? Pitch is number one for English. What's number one for Chinese? Loudness. No, loudness is not number one. Again, loudness is usually the. Of course it will be involved because when we use more energy, we're going to be louder. That will naturally happen, but it's not the most important one. First? Length is number one. Just say, all of the people were there. Say it in Chinese. Yeah, say it again. Did you lengthen it? Say it without emphasis. Say it very, very ping pong with no emphasis. All right, now say it with emphasis. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? You lengthen to emphasize. Number one is lengthening in Chinese. That's number one. Okay? Loudness may come after that. There will be some pitches, but they're usually more global differences of pitch. Your whole voice will get louder and higher and more excited. It's not just those syllables. For pitch and other things, usually, so if you're just saying something in a very plain way, 所有的人都到了. 所有的人都到了,那是整句话,整个都很兴奋,都很那个声音比较高,那是整句话,不是单单只有所有的这个phrase, right? So you will have pitch differences, but usually they're global, G-L-O-B-A-L, global. 全世界的表示说是整句,而不是说 local, it's not local, it's not just a few words. Those are, those are actually technical terms, global and local. So it's often a global rise in pitch when you're going to emphasize something and you're excited. So length is the main thing that you play around with in Chinese. Good. Anything else? OK, did that answer your question? Uh, yes. OK, anybody else? Anybody else? If you're okay, then just hand in your work. We don't want to spend a lot of time just waiting for you to page through things like I told you. So if there are no more questions, hand in your work. And Sophie will pick it up. And for next week, you need to read and summarize chapter three. And then after that, we're going to jump out of order. The only thing left on my list now is reading in the textbook. Does anybody have any other business that you want to bring up or questions? Okay, otherwise we're just going to start reading. Okay, we're in 146, is that right? 146? And our first reader is? Okay, Vivian. Go ahead. Uh, Vivian, uh, the spelling system regularly used in books and newspapers in Zulu and... In Co Zulu? Don't go down when we're not finished. In Zulu and... In Zulu and Kosa. 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 <laughs> okay, practice that one. Everyone, have you practiced your lateral click? Okay, Kosa. And it's aspirated. Kosa. Go ahead. Kosa. Employs the letters uh, C, Q, X for the dental post. Uh, yeah, pause, you've got a comma there. <laughs> The dental post no, the dental the dental right post elevator and lateral clicks for clicks clicks mm -hmm. for which we have been using the symbols vertical line exclamation point and double vertical line 
respectively. All right, everybody knows how to read those symbols and words now? The first one is? Then? Exclamation point and double vertical line. I want you to memorize these. I want you to remember them. C is what kind of a click? Everybody? C represents a dental click. Q represents a post alveolar click and X represents a lateral click and that's why posa is pronounced with a lateral click plus aspiration. So I want you to remember those. C dental, Q post alveolar, X lateral. It's not that hard and it's, it'll make a lot of things make more sense when you read them. Okay, go ahead. The name of the language Hosa. Hosa. Let's try it, everybody. Hosa. 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 Okay, good. Should therefore be pronounced with a lateral click at the, at the beginning. 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 Okay, now you can go high because we've got a period coming. Mm -hmm. At the beginning. At the beginning. Good. The. V. V. Uh huh. The H following the. V. Oh, Another one. The H following the orthographic. Ortha. Ortha. Yeah, it's a schwa. You're doing ortho. fine. Ortha. Okay. Or orthographic. <laughs> You're doing fine. Mm, indicate indicates. A Here's just X. Here you can read the letter X. Oh, that's what you were stre being stressed out over. Here you can just read X. Orthographic means in spelling. In spelling, it's an X. You don't have to go this time. The orthographic X X X okay. indicates a short burst of aspiration. Not as 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 mm -hmm. aspiration following the click. Try saying the name of the language with an aspirated lateral click at the beginning. Table six point three shows it shows a set of contrasting clicks in calls. Okay, you're trying now, that's good. <laughs> Nearly all the words in this table are infinitive forms of words, which is why they begin with the prefix uku. All right, and those diacritical marks over the vowels indicate what? In an African language, when you see a diacritical mark like ipie over a vowel, what does it indicate? Tone. Tone. Or sometimes they have other marks. And they indicate the tone. And we're going to learn later in the chapter, or in vowels and consonants, I think it is, that what is one difference from, say, Mandarin tones and typical tones of a, or the tones of a typical African language? One difference is that we tend to have contour tones. That will be in vowels and consonants. Have you had it yet or not? No, hi, may all. Contour, C-O-N-T-O-U-R. Contour, that means a... It's, no level it's the opposite of level. So level is just flat. Contour means it has some kind of a tree xian. Contour is some kind of a tree xian. You find a lot of contour tones in Chinese, not just Mandarin in many of the dialects. But African tones, are typically just level tones. And we're now on clicks, so let's go to... Actually, we have a lot of interesting things on clicks, but let's go to Peter Ladefogel first. And here is that table. We're going to play some of the files. Um, the first one is a dental click, and it is voiceless, unaspirated, right? Let's, see, let's listen to how it sounds. Hopefully the speaker's working. We've got it here. Let's try again. Everybody ready? I'm going to make it louder. I'm going to play it several times, and I want you to look at how they write it. This is just the regular spelling. Or no, it's IPA. It's IPA. Um, this is the IPA spelling, and what kind of a click do we have here? It's dental, and like it says, it's voiceless, unaspirated. Just listen several times and read the transcription as you listen to grind fine. 
Now you see a diacritic above the second U. What tone is that? Is that a high or low tone? You can hear it right away. That's one thing you have an advantage on is tones. You're very good at hearing tones because you've got it in your native language. Try to say it. Okay, don't do it too soon. The K is not a, uh, is not a click. So, uku ola. There's a K there. But forget the K for a while. Just try to get the click. Uku ola. Now try to put the K in there. Uku ola. Uku ola. Uku ola. I'm not doing it well myself. Uku ola. I had to stop. Uku ola. Okay, good. Listen a few more times and we'll try another one. Good, all right. Let's try the post alveolar one. All right, this one's post alveolar and we've also got an implosive. And implosives are really normal in southern African languages. You find them all the time and they're not strongly implosive. Sometimes they're just allophonic with regular voiced Bs. But ejectives, tones, clicks, implosive, they're all common in Southern Africa. But it's not a big deal, because when we were there, we had to sing songs with these sounds. And you don't have to make a big deal of it when you're singing. You just And you get used to it, because there are just so many of them. You just get used to it. Just listen a few times. You can hear it's much louder, the post alveolar click. The dental one is not that loud. Try, listen. Go. Ukukoba. Uh -huh. Let's try the alveolar lateral. All right. Okay. Um, let's just go through the other ones before break so you get familiar with them. The next one is voiceless aspirated. We had voiceless unaspirated. Now let's listen to voiceless aspirated. So look at the transcription and listen a few times first. Did you hear the aspiration? Cola, cola, cola. Okay. That was dental. Let's go to post alveolar. Listen a few times. Listen three times without repeating. Just listen. Okay, this time repeat. Okay. Ow. Lateral. Listen three times. This time repeat. Okay. Let's try. Oh, we haven't done murmured yet, so we're going to skip that. Murmured hameoshia. Voiced velar nasal. We'll listen to it. I guess I will play it for you, but you don't have to repeat this one because we're going to learn this very soon. Just listen. Did you hear it go low? 
the pitch is quite low, lower than what we just had, right? Zoba, all right. That has to do with the murmuring. Okay, and then that's one sample. That's enough. Let's go to the voiced velar nasal. Let's get the ng sound in it. Try, listen. Go. Ukunoma. That one's easier, isn't it? The nasal. Ukunoma. Let's try the post alveolar. Repeat this time. Okay, one sorry. That was my timing. Go. It's not. It's just one. Uh, one jechu of the tongue tip with your post alveolar area. So, ukunola. 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 All right. And one more in this line. This one's the lateral click. Listen three times. Ni. It has kind of a funny vowel. Once more, try repeating. And we have one more line here. Murmured velar nasal, I'll just play it for you because again we haven't had murmured vowels yet. All right, so we got through this table, most of it, demonstrating clicks in Hosa. Um, do you have any questions? Do you know how they work now? We're going to practice the clicks a little bit more because I think we should all learn the basic ones. They're not that difficult. Because right in, in second hour, we're going to finish up basically the first half of chapter six because chapter six, the title is Airstream Mechanisms and not phonation, phonation, right. We are almost done with airstream mechanisms. With clicks, we're going to finish. Uh, which we'll finish on page 147. That's the end of our discussion on airstream mechanisms. So we'll do a quick review of them second hour right after we finish this part of the chapter. Okay, take a break. We're continuing. We're going to finish. We're now going to finish the first half of chapter six. So there's going to be probably less lala in this semester than last semester because last semester there were so many other things to do that we often worked into each chapter. We will still have other things now, but our goal is to finish the book. That's our main goal. And I want you to learn the material well. A lot of these sounds are exotic and weird, so you may not get them right away. I don't expect you to produce them on the spot. But with practice, I hope you learn all the sounds, including implosives. So make that part of your, mm, your list, your to-do list things that you want to accomplish, your, your list of goals. I want you to learn the different airstream mechanisms that we've learned here, uh, each type of sound. And then also, we're going to go on to the different types of phonation. Those are not going to be so hard. I think you'll have no problem with those. But as for these exotic sounds, there's going to be more. These are not the only ones. But these are the weirdest manners of, well, airstream mechanism. They're, they're manners of producing the sound. The sounds that we're going to be learning in the chapter after this, this is consonantal gestures. The issue there is more place of articulation is going to be strange. For example, we haven't used the uvula very much yet. We didn't need that for English, mostly. Although some English speakers have a very uvular L, like all. Oh. 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 Mine is probably pretty uvular. But normally we don't need a lot of those 
articulatory organs, but we're going to learn sounds like, for example, a uvular trill, which you use in German and French, especially German, northern German. So we're going to be doing trills, but mainly we're going to be learning to use some different places of articulation we haven't used before very much. Let's now finish up part one of chapter six. Go ahead. Wendy, the CD also illustrates clicks in Zulu. In Zulu, remember before you're done, continuation rise, everybody. If it's not on your schedule of improvements to make, please put it there, okay? In Zulu, a language, is, a language <coughs> closely related to Kosa. Kosa. And say, a, what's a language? Language. Language. Make it longer. Language. Language. Yeah. A language closely, re closely related to Kosa. Kosa. And in Nama. And in Nama and... We solved that one last class. Just call it Ko. Ko. We're just calling it Ko. 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 Two Hoisan languages spoken in Nam. Hoisan. 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 Or you can just say Khoisan. Khoisan. Mm -hmm. Two Khoisan languages spoken in Namibia and Botswana. 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 Namibia. Namibia. Not in English we say Namibia, not Namibia. 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 Right. And Khoi and San are two different language groups. Those are Bushman languages. They are a minority, like I said. They're like a Yuanjumin of the area who have been pushed far south by the aggressive Bantus. And Khoi, often they write it Khoi hyphen San. They're two different language groups of Bushmen. Go on. You can find examples of these languages by going to the index of the languages. Uh, going to the? Going to the index of languages. And the index. Mayo ant. <laughs> By going to the index of languages. Languages? In, languages. Mm -hmm. The index of sounds. Index. Index. Good. Index of sounds. And or the map index. Watch the the or the. Or the mm -hmm. map index. Map index. Map index. Right. All of which are accessible from. Are what? A uh-huh. Yeah, everybody remember that one. Two C's is usually K plus C, like accept, accept, access, accessible. The first one is K, the second one is C. Okay. Accessible mm -hmm. from the foot of... From the foot. From the foot of the title page. Good. They are also there listed... There are... Uh, they are, sorry. They are. They are also, also... Try not to put a glottal stop. Not they are, but they are. They are right. They are also listed on the contents page for this chapter. All right, going to the index of languages. We've got a general index. We've got further reading. We've got a glossary. We've got notes. We've got an appendix here. B. Appendix A. Ah, don't we have an, uh, what are they talking about here? Yeah, they're talking about the CD here then. They didn't put it in the book. This is all about the CD. I thought they would maybe have it in the book as well, but they don't. So you can go to the index of languages and then you can find the links leading to the sounds um, that you find in the tables here. Okay, um, did you finish? Yes, they are also listed. Good, next. Tina. Table 6.4 summarize the principle. Summer. Rised. Rise. Rises. Why is it rises? Uh, Anybody want to know why I keep repeating myself? <laughs> yeah. Because it's a sibilant. Therefore, we say summarizes. <laughs> summarizes. Watch that. Let's review the sibilants. What are they? S. Z. 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 All right, and this one is z. Go ahead. Summarizes mm -hmm. the principal airstream mechanisms. Note that. Hmm? Note that. Yeah. 
Harmonic sounds can be voiced or voiceless. Okay, don't make that all too long. And I've repeated this a lot, and this is habit. But you'll probably need to practice. Everyone, voiced. Voiced. Watch me when I say it. The gesture is really short. For the other diphthongs, you need to make it pretty long, but you also need to pronounce the second element. For this one, the a oh is really quite short, especially compared to what I hear in Taiwan. In British, it's a bit longer. My British friend it does make it longer. So, voiced. Voiced. It's not voiced. Not voiced. 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 Voiceless. Voiceless. Voiceless, not less. Less. Voiceless. Voiceless. There we go. Okay. Glottalic, aggressive. Watch the k. Once more. Glottalic. Mm hmm. Aggressive sounds. 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 Everybody sing the little song when we're not done. Continuation rise. Glottalic, aggressive sounds. Glottalic, aggressive sounds. Ejectives. Same pitch. Ejectives because that's a tone way yu. How do you say tone way yu in English? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Sylvie has it. Louder. Uh, close. Close. A positive. Just a kending nigga positive. Chimen ja AP. A positive. It's an a positive. And a positive, that's a tong wei yu. That's a word you heard all the time through high school and junior high, right? But never heard it in English. No, I mean tong wei yu, you heard a lot. But probably never heard the English. A positive. That means you're repeating what you just said in different terms, usually more specific. So, glottalic aggressive sounds, ejectives, try it. Glottalic Aggressive sounds. You, you have to watch the k. Glatalic, <coughs> aggressive sounds. Good. Ejective. Good. Ejectives. Ejectives mm -hmm. are always voiceless. All right. Always, like I said, there may be an exception here and there, but it's so rare, we're just going to forget about it. Go on. Glatalic, ingress. Watch the k. In Glatalic, aggressive sounds. All right. Sounds, implosives. Are always nearly always voiced. Voiced. By, voiced. 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 Good. By being combined with a pulmonic aggressive pulmonic pulmonic air aggressive airstream. Airstream. But, airstream. Good. By voiceless glottalic aggressive Glot sound. Glottalic. Glot glottalic. Good. Ingress aggressive sounds, voiceless implosives. Implosives? Implosives have been reported in, in, in a few languages. Languages? Languages such as the the, the Oweri mm -hmm. dialect of... Dialect? Dialect. Not da. Dialect. Dialect Good. of Iqbo. Uh -huh. Spoken in in not spoken in, in it's spoken in, in spoken in right Nigeria good spoken in Lianyin spoken, spoken in. in spoken in Nigeria good and that was one of the languages of Nigeria we learned about when we learned about missionaries going there it's called either Igbo or Igbo I think they are both they are both correct. Igbo or Igbo. It's the same language. And the other major language, also a very big language, Nigeria is a very large country. It has the largest population of any country in Africa. They have a, I don't remember what it is, but they have a very huge population. And they have many, many languages, but these are the two main ones, Igbo and, or Igbo and Yoruba. And do you think these two, two groups of people like each other? No, they don't. <laughs> They're always jealous of each other. They're always putting each other down. These people feel superior. These people feel superior. And it goes on and on. Okay. Um, the other thing that you need to watch out for when you are reading words that are quite similar, except for one little part. Which part do we stress? For example, aggressive, ingressive. For these two, what are we going to stress? Normally, it's aggressive, ingressive. However, when we contrast them, what do we do? Egressive and ingressive. We move the stress so the listener can hear which part is contrasting. 
So we'll read it like this. Note that pulmonic sounds can be voiced or voiceless. Nothing is really contrasting here, no problem. Glottalic egressive sounds, ejectives, are always voiceless. Glottalic ingressive sounds, implosives, are nearly always, nearly always voiced. Here we say nearly. Nearly gets more stress because the other one is absolute. Is or they are always voiced. But a uh, voiceless, sorry. Ejectives are always voiceless. But implosives are nearly always voiced. Nearly always voiced. They nearly can voice. Do yao fang zhong yin. Yin wei voice can voiceless. Yo, dui bi. Now how always can nearly yo dui bi. So are nearly always voiced by being combined with a pulmonic egressive airstream. We need to make the E clear so we know which one it is. We need to listen carefully and be able to catch it easily. But voiceless, glottalic, ingressive sounds, ingressive sounds make the whole thing clear because it's so important and it's an unusual word. Voiceless implosives have been reported in a few languages such as the Oweri dialect of Igbo spoken in Nigeria. Let's continue. Uh, forget the next, the part in Kwa uh, Hao Vilari ingressive sounds click. Clicks. Clicks. Not cli. Click. Click. Uh huh. Clicks. Very good. Maybe combined with pulmonic ingressive sounds. Careful. Pulmonic. E ingressive. Right. You have to make sure that you don't accidentally nasalize it because then we will think it's ingressive, just the opposite. Once more, pulmonic. Pulmonic. Egressive sounds. Right. So that the re sounds. Sounds. Right. So that the resulting combination can be voiced or voiceless. These combinations these can these make it more these mm -hmm. combinations can also be oral, oral, or oral, mm -hmm. or nasal. All right. Oral is the way I say it. But ask Miss mm -hmm. Hadzima. Does anybody have a class with Miss Hadzima? Henry, who oh, and Nilashi. I think she says aural. I just heard it the other day. I think she says aural. She's from more eastern part of the country. Hajan's in Maryland. She says aural, and that's more east coast. I say oral. Mm, just like horrible, horrible. I'll say horrible. Um, how about if you all silently reread this paragraph yourself and concentrate so you understand what it said? Because we were so busy with pronunciation, we couldn't think. So reread it yourself silently and concentrate. Everybody's read the paragraph? Now this is very nong suo, right? Very jing lian. This contains a lot of information about these unusual sounds that we've just learned. It sort of summarizes their main features here. So this is a very useful paragraph for review. You might want to mark that when you're preparing for a test and you need to review Go to this paragraph, and if you forget what some of this stuff is about, then go back into the main part of the chapter. But this is a very succinct review of what we've just covered, as is the table below it. Now we're going to get it in table format. Um, I think I will just go over that with you so we get through it. First of all, we have three different kinds of airstream mechanisms, okay, pulmonic, glottalic, and valeric. Pulmonic is the one we're most familiar with. It is the default for all languages of the world. the airstream mechanism, is pulmonic. It's just the default for every single language of the world. It is egressive. Egressive is also the default for all languages. Although many languages have other sounds, egressive is the default. That's what we assume unless something is marked as being a bit different. And we describe it in this way, lung air is pushed out under the control of the respiratory muscles. So And what kind of stops are produced with a pulmonic aggressive airstream mechanism? They are called plosives. So that's a specific meaning for plosive. That's why I didn't want to use it last semester so much. Stops keeps it really general. Um, but plosives are those specific sounds that we learned for English, PTK, BDG. And they can be, the vocal folds may be doing one of two things. They may either be, it says voiceless, but if we want to use a verb with 
Vocal folds as the subject, the vocal folds are open. That's right, they're open. Or they may be pulled tightly together, closed, and air is pushed through, then we have voicing. Then the sound is voiced. So part, this first part of the table is what we're most familiar with from English and Mandarin as well. The second airstream mechanism is glottalic. And it is also, the first kind of glottalic airstream mechanism is also egressive. And pharynx air is compressed by the upward movement of the closed glottis. That means we have closed our vocal folds. And then, to push air out. We've got to stop somewhere in the vocal tract, in the oral tract. The stop will be released and we have a little explosion. That's ejective. We will assume that they are all voiceless. I don't know about the exceptions. I really don't know if they really exist or not, but they are, we are assuming all ejectives are voiceless. Then we have a second kind of glottalic airstream mechanism. This kind is not aggressive, it's ingressive air is coming in, but we know that air is also being pushed out at the same time. So we've, we have air going in two directions. We have a downward movement of the vibrating glottis. Pulmonic, aggressive airstream may also be involved. So we are making a very, very voiced stop. And then we push our whole, whole toe, our larynx down. You can hear it going down. And because most, in, uh, most implosives are voiced, we also have air coming up. So we've got air going in two directions, it says may. If it is voiced, then we will have air also coming through the vocal folds, so we also have an aggressive airstream mechanism involved. So we classify it as ingressive. If you say egressive, you say, well, it's partly egressive. No, it's classified as ingressive. However, an egressive airstream mechanism is also involved in producing this kind of sound. And the name for this kind of a stop, these are all stops. Is implosive. Okay, that's nei And the symbol is, remember, on the upper part of the symbol of the character, we have a hook going right. And what are the vocal folds doing? They are usually voiced by the pulmonic airstream. So the voicing part involves an egressive mechanism, and that is pulmonic. So that one's sort of the most complicated. No, clicks, I guess, are more complicated. It gets a little more complicated the further down the table we get. This one's all clear, right? Implosives are clear. Try practicing them on your own. Try to master them. Finally, the last kind, the third kind that we have learned about, and they all involve clicks, is the valeric airstream mechanism. This one is ingressive, air is being sucked in to the mouth. So mouth air is rarefied. We've got a little a pocket of air sealed in the front, it may be alveolar, it may be bilabial, it may be postalveolar, it may be palatal. And that's the front place that it's sealed off. The back place will be the back of the tongue, and the soft palate. So it's got two places where it's sealed off, front and back. The back one has to be velaric. And we've got this little pocket of air, and then we expand, we expand the volume by putting our tongue down. That's going to make the space larger, but we have no air coming in, so the air becomes rarefied. That means that we've got negative pressure, air outside and below, but mainly we're concerned about outside, is going to be higher than the air pressure inside that pocket, which has now been expanded without getting fresh air. And so when we release the stop, we've got air rushing in and making a clicking noise. So, and, and, and. All right, so those are the different symbols. We've got four different kinds that they've taught here, but there, as <coughs> Jerome mentioned during break or after class last time, if you go to the front of the book, or is it the back? I keep forgetting which. Yeah, it's the back, sorry. They reverse the order. But now it's in the back. 
So look at consonants, non-pulmonic. It's the box in the middle of the page on the inside back cover. And it says clicks, and they show you five different kinds of clicks. We only learned four. And Jerome said, why don't they teach us the fifth one? And I don't have an answer for that. I wondered too. Because when I was in South Africa, I definitely heard palato alveolar clicks. Oh, mine are so lame. They make them so loud there. All right. Just pull your tongue further in. So post alveolar, palato alveolar, All right. And I haven't put the links up, but I, I plan to do so. So five main kinds of clicks. They teach you four. But please also know the last one. It's very easy. It's just like a is not equal to sign. 不等于,then那个符号就可以了。只是那条线,直线是比较直一点。不等于是写线,对不对? This one is a 直线。So equal sign, 直线,that's a palatal alveolar click. 舌头更后面一点。And that summarizes the principal airstream processes. And a couple, and under glottalic, we have two different kinds. Do we have any questions? Use the book, use the sound files, practice these. It's fun. Like I said, they're a good party trick. What are you doing in phonetics class? You can bow in some clicks. It's fun. It's great stuff. We're now moving on to states of the glottis, the vocal folds. Technically, the glottis is the space between the vocal folds, but we're often talking about the vocal folds themselves and what they're doing. They're the ones that are, they're the things that are controlling the action. So now we are starting on part two of chapter six, page 148. Are we okay with part one, pretty much? Good. Next reader, please. And remember to read the chapter headings, or the section headings. Miranda, states of the glottis. So far, we have been considering sounds to be either voices with the vocal folds apart or voiced. With or the voiced. Or, or voiced. voiced. Yeah, you're right. That's good. With the vocal uh, with the folds nearly together so that together, together right. so that they will vibrate when air passes between them. Between them. I like between better. Between is okay. So, so far so good. This is just recapping what we already know, what we take for granted. But actually there are some things that we didn't learn last semester because they don't apply to English. We only learned what we needed for English. Now we're going to venture out into some different things you can do with the vocal folds. Go ahead. But in fact, the glottis, which is defined as the space between the vocal folds, can assume a number of other shapes. Mm -hmm. shapes. shapes. Look at my mouth. That's pretty good. Shapes. shapes. Yeah. Don't round shapes too much, watch. A lot of you are saying shapes, but it's shapes. shapes. That's good. Some of these glottis states are important in the description of other languages and in the description of pathological voices. Okay, and pathological means? Bing li fang mian de. That means there's something wrong with them. They're not able to say certain sounds correctly. There's something wrong with the way they talk. Next. Photographs of four states of the glottis are shown in figure 6.6. .6. That was good, and I'm going to get really picky with you. Um, if something belongs together, try to keep it together. So photographs of four states of the glottis. So one break after photographs, and then keep four states of the glottis together. Photograph, pho photographs of four states of the, gla of the glottis are shown. Glottis. 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 Gladys mm -hmm. are shown in figure 6.6. .6. These photographs were taken by placing a small mirror at mirror. the... Mirror. You're still failing to do a continuation right. So these photographs were taken by placing a small mirror. All of those have continuation rises, and you're, you're mostly going down. So if you go up just a little bit, it'll sound more natural. These photographs were taken by placing a small mirror at the back of the mouth so that it, would, it was possible. It was possible. So that it was possible to look straight down the pharynx towards the larynx. No S, yes, but towards is also correct. You sound great now with the continuation rises. It sounds much more natural that way. Go on. The top of the picture is, toward, uh, is towards the front of the neck. 
Okay, I'm thinking you might want to know the differences between British and American. In British, it is toward, 没有错 toward. 那是英式，美式是 toward. Everyone, toward. Toward. No W. Toward. Toward. No W at all. 没有 W. Toward. Good. Toward. All right, 英式 toward. Yeah, and I think I do that one okay. 那个发音还可以 Toward. Toward. Uh huh. Toward. The top of a picture is toward the front, the front of the neck, the lower part toward the back. Right. Let's orient ourselves. So first of all, we've got four pictures down here. Those are actual pictures that they took of the Gladys, but they're not totally proportional. 它的大小没有完全统一 So some look bigger, some look smaller. The lower right-hand corner, we see one that looks smaller because 下面的部分是黑影子里面看不清楚 That's one reason. 可是它整个那个大小也没有完全按照比例，没有完全统一。Keep that in mind. So if they look kind of out of proportion, it's because they are. But it's difficult to get these photographs and make them perfectly the same size.、Um, the top of the picture is toward the front of the neck. So the vocal folds, the top of the picture that's up here, the 上面，是我们的喉咙这个前面 ，right? That's the 前面 So remember that that's the front, and then the part. At the bottom is the part in back. You need to have that orientation in mind, or you'll you won't know what it's really showing us. So the top is the front, the bottom is the back. Let's go on. The vocal folds are the white band running vertically in each picture. Their position can be adjusted by the by the movements of of the uh, uh, retinoid. You're doing fine. Arytenoid. Uh, stress is on the second syllable. Arytenoid. There you go, everyone.、Uh, everyone. Arytenoid. 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 Uh huh. Arytenoid. Cartilages. Cartilages. Rangu. All right, and then arytenoid. I've forgotten the Chinese, but you can see the thing that、uh, the cartilage that's involved in opening and closing the vocal folds is the arytenoid cartilages. By the movements of arytenoid cartilages, which are underneath the small protuberances visible visible in the lower part of the pictures. Good. Okay. Protuberances, 突出物 Right. Thank you. Can you write it on the board, please? I looked these up before, and I probably have it in a list in my notes here. But it's not one that I remember. Oh, that's not hard to remember, actually. Yeah, Tang Shao de Shao. Very good. Okay, everybody, say the Chinese name. There you go. Arytenoid cartilage. Everyone. Good. Yeah. A retinoid. A retin? Huh? A retinoid. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. <laughs> I've heard this. I've heard these talked about in many ink pen, and what I've heard is a retinoid, a retinoid. That sounds. I've never ever heard that before.、Um, what kind of dictionary do you have? Is it Besta? Try, try Merriam-Webster. We'll try it later. We don't have time now. But try Merriam-Webster or something else. If if they do it differently, I'll accept it. But I don't accept Besta. All right.、Mm, let's go on. Annie, in a voiced sound. All right, not voiced. <coughs> voiced. 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 Yep. Good. In a voiced sound, the vocal folds are close together. Close together. Close together. Watch that, everybody. You have to watch poyinzi. Um, when I was in、uh, fourth year Chinese, we had a we had a teacher who was known as the Dragon Lady. Actually, she was a very good teacher. But somebody said Gan Long Chen in the Huang Di. She yelled at us for twenty minutes. He 骂我骂了二十分钟 Gan Long Chen, Gan Gan Long Huang Di. We were only, I mean, I mean, we were we were not beginners, but it was too advanced for us. We really didn't know that. We should have checked it in the dictionary. But we were just reading in class, and when she heard that, she just yelled and yelled and yelled. I mean, that was such a terrible mistake. 
Um, so now nobody says Ganong Huangdi anymore. <laughs> um, now this one isn't quite so literary. Close and close are extremely common words, both of them. So you have to read ahead and analyze it to make sure you know which it is. So close is a verb, right? Close is the adjective. Close and close. Ahead. So close together, here it's the adjective. The vocal, folds, uh, the vocal folds are close together. And you could actually call it an adverb here. Go ahead. And vibrating. Vibrating. Please, nobody. Actually, it's vibrating in British, so it's not that bad a mistake. But since we're doing American, stress is on the first syllable. Vibrating. And vibrating, as in the first photograph. In a voiceless sound. In a voiceless sound. Sound 比较虚,而且有对比. So, in a voice sound, blah, blah, blah. In a voiceless sound. In a voiceless sound. Voiceless. Voiceless. Good. Sound. As in the second, photogra uh, second photograph. Second photograph, because we've already mentioned. First photograph. First photograph, right? As in the second photograph. Mm-mm. Photo. We don't stress photograph because we've already mentioned As it. As in the second photograph, right? They are pulled apart. Pulled. Pulled. Good. Everyone pulled. Pulled. That's written as a short u, uh, but because of the l, it changes. It sounds kind of weird. So, for example, put. That's the default sound. Put. Everyone put. Put. Uh huh. But. Before L, the vowel will change quite a bit. L changes vowels a lot. Pull. Pull. Jibu is a male, some rounding in American especially, pull. but in British too as well. Everyone, pull. Pull. Look at my mouth. Do you see rounding? Pull. 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 Do you see rounding? I don't feel much rounding. So pull. That one is weird. But we use the symbol because that's the right phoneme. It's just a different allophone. Go ahead. This position will produce a completely... This position? This position... Remember, we, start, we stop after the entire subject. And if we stop, that means we have a little continuation rise there. So one of our duty for today for everybody is watch those continuation rises at pauses. It's not a huge one. It's not this position. We don't have to overdo it. But there is a gentle continuation rise. This position, this position, position... Z is the tonic stress. This position. This position. Good. And everybody also know the S is pronounced as Z, P, Z. And also the I is not E, it's I. P, Z, P, Z, P, Z. This position. This position. This position very good. Very will good. produce a completely voiceless sound. Voiceless sound. A voiceless completely voiceless sound. sound. Voiceless sound. Mm -hmm. If there is a little or no... Mm, if there is what? Little. Right. Why did I get so picky about a? Uh? Because I have a little time and I have little time. Totally. totally different things, right? I have a little time. I have little time. That means... Right? Okay. If there is little or no airflow through the glottis. Glottis. Glottis, as in the case of a voiceless fricative or an unaspirated stop. Unaspirated. Unaspirated. Oh. Unaspirated. Uh -huh. Right. Stop. Okay, now this stuff is getting really technical. Well, not getting, it's always been, but this is really quite technical. So let's look at each photograph as he's describing it as they are describing it, and understand what's being said. If it's a voice sound, which is the upper left-hand corner, everybody's looking. Some people are, like my father-in-law was. And he was forced to become right-handed when he was young. Did that happen to any of you? You were, and now you're right-handed. Yes. Do you still do some things with your left hand? Uh, I, like when I eats the steak, I use the knife with my left hand. So do I. No, I don't. No, I don't. You're right. Okay, that's, is that the only one? And sometimes I mix the direction. That happens, doesn't it? Okay, that happened with my gong gong because he was originally a zuo but he was forced to become yo which happened to most people of his 
of his generation, even in your generation, you were forced to become right-handed. How old? What, how did it happen? Um, when I uh, when I was in the well, I was about three or four years old mm -hmm. because uh, at that time I started to write how to write words, and my mother said uh, at that time all of the adults in my family says that we have to use the right hand to write. But for my sister, it's okay. She became left-handed? Yes. Is that because she's a girl? <laughs> no, I, I think it's because... Oh, my mother told her to write with the right hand, but mm -hmm. she can use the chopsticks with her left hand. But how about writing? She still writes with her right hand now. Yes, because uh, all of the writing taught in school is right-handed. So it's, I think it's more convenient for us to use our right hand to write. It's true, it's more convenient to, to live in the world because the world is designed for people who are right-handed everywhere, right? Like even the way you use a phone, the way you use scissors, all kinds of things, they're, divine, they're, they're designed for right-handed people. Oh yeah, I, I, I use the phone with my left hand. There you go, okay, how about scissors? Uh, I can use it for both. You can use either hand. Yes. Is anybody else left-handed in the class? No lefties. I, I understand about one quarter of the world is left-handed. Sorry? Oh yeah, okay. I've noticed in recent years, okay, this is now my 23rd year teaching. Now I see a lot of students writing with their left hand and I'm always a little surprised. There are quite a few now in your, your, in your age group who use their left hand. But when I first started teaching, there were very few because people were still being forced to change then. And that, I think, for some people, it affects your orientation. Because for me, even now, after living in the world all these years, I think, right, the hand I write with is right. I think, I still think that now to make sure I get right and left correct. Right, that's the hand I write with. So if you can write with either hand, it's easy to confuse which one it is. Anyway, when my, when my Gong Gong was still alive and we'd be driving, he had a driver, Tai Chen Yoga Siji. He was a Jun Guan. Anyway, he would say, Chen Men Yo Zuan. And then Yo Zuan, Yo Zuan, Yo Zuan, Yo Zuan. He said, Well, it's Yo Zuan. But Yo Zuan, Yo Zuan. Happened all the time. <laughs> all right, mm, left and right. <clears throat> Right. Um, so the reason I ask is I just want to make sure everybody can keep left and right straight. Upper left hand corner. Um, that's an example of vocal folds when they are producing a voice sound. So you can see this is the back. You can see the arytenoid cartilages. They, they're, the, they're what push the vocal folds together. And so they're tight. And then the air pushes through. The tissue, the air will push through and then they pop back together. Push through, they pop back together. And that produces a voice sound. So that's the first, the first sentence. In a voice sound, the vocal folds are close together and vibrating as in the first photograph. We're okay with that one, right? Second sentence. In a voiceless sound, okay? Or in the in. As in the second photograph, okay, so 右边上面, the 右边那个图, um, they are pulled apart. This position will produce a completely voiceless sound if there is little or no airflow through the glottis, as in the case of a voiceless fricative or an unaspirated stop. So we call that completely voiced, uh, voiceless in that case. So All right, a voiceless fricative, unaspirated stop. We get no voicing at all. But now we're going to move into what we didn't talk about earlier, those examples that I went through kind of quickly with Hosa. If there is considerable airflow, how about if we just finish one paragraph? Go. But if there is a considerable... Mail up. There is considerable airflow as in... an. H like sound. Everybody H. H. Right. H like sound. H like sound. Good. The vocal folds will be set vibrating 
vibrating while remaining apart. All right, look in the lower left-hand corner, and you can see that the vocal folds are partly open. They're not really wide open, but there's a really heavy flow of air. 那个空气的流浪很大，流流流量 ，not 流浪，流量。That's hard. Okay, 流量很大。Go on. In this way. They they produce what is called breath called called、mm -hmm. breathy voice or murmur. All right, everybody, breathy voice. Breathy voice. Murmur. Murmur. And by the way, in school you learn that murmur is 有点难难那自言自语嘛 We don't use that often. We say mumbling, mumbling to yourself. We usually don't use murmur at all. It's a very old word actually. So if you say he's over there just murmuring to himself, don't he's mumbling to himself? English is mumbling, was a murmur. We're going to use it in a technical sense though for phonetics. This is a special kind of sound. We'll just finish the paragraph and then we'll practice it next time. Okay, let's just sort of get some of the ideas in our head. Go on. The second photograph is labeled voiceless because voiceless voiceless good because this is a this is the usual position、good. in voiceless. Fricatives,、okay. but in an intervocalic, as in a head, the vocal folds are in a very in a very similar position.、Mm -hmm. In a, in a good very similar position.、Mm -hmm. In these circumstances,、good. they will produce breathy voice, vi vibrating loosely. So. So they appear to be simply flapping in the airstream. In the airstream, right? In the airstream. You still need to work on voice. You still say voice. 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 Good. Go on. The third photograph shows another kind of breathy voice. In this sound, the vocal folds are apart between the arytenoid, arytenoid cartilages, ledges. In the lower posterior, posterior. Part, posterior part of the photograph, they can still vibrate, vibrate, but, vibrate,、mm -hmm. but at the same time, a great deal of air passes out through the glottis. All right, and I will just demonstrate what it is, so you know what it is. It's not difficult. It's just if you make a voiced H, and then. You produce a lot of air while you're doing it. <sighs> you're all good at it. <sighs> It's sort of the way you sound when you have a respiratory problem. You're in Chi Chuan, some of the Soho, you're lazy to eat. And that's all we need to know this far. It's going to go together with stops, especially in Indian languages. Like B, what they write as B H is ba, ba. And we'll learn about that next time. Very good. So you have your assignment for vowels and consonants, and I won't forget it next Wednesday. I promise myself and you. We will also have a dictation, usually on Wednesdays. We will have a dictation. Wednesday we'll have a dictation. Next time we will have some implosives. Certainly some implosives next time. You did, I'm sure, okay, pretty well on this one.、Um, review in the textbook. Remember to. To carry out your pronunciation improvement program, you can revise it as you go along. 就说你发现你进会了，你就可以换新的，或者这个需要多一点时间没关系，或者是发现一个新的音要加也可以。And、um, Sophie, anything else? That's it. Okay, we'll see you on Monday.